In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning God, in the beginning God created the heavens. Now scientists have gotten a little bit more detailed and they call it the Big Bang. Now we got to remember that our sun is a star, a ball of fire. And scientists say that at this point in time, in our own galaxy, there are a hundred billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And the Hubble telescope scientists say there are 125 billion galaxies. And our entire universe is now still experiencing the Big Bang. It's still expanding. Someone might say, goodness gracious, great balls of fire. You see, if anyone has a question, is there a God? Look into the heavens and follow the fire. In Genesis chapter 19, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with burning sulfur from the heavens. Yet he spared Lot. If anyone questions the absolute righteousness and justice of God, follow the fire and the smoke left behind. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses goes to Mount Oreb, the mountain of God, at 80 years old, and God calls him to save his people. If anyone questions, can God use me anymore? If anyone asks the question, am I too old to dream? Look at Moses and follow the fire. In 2 Kings chapter 6, the chariots of fire of God's heavenly army emboldened and outnumbered Israel. If anyone asks the question, can God overcome seemingly impossible odds? Look up and see the chariots of fire and follow the fire. Are you with me here, church? In Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the burning furnace that killed the guys that threw them on in. And yet when Nebuchadnezzar looked inside, there was a fourth guy in the furnace. If anyone asks the question, is God with me in the hardest times? All they need to do is ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and follow the fire. Are you with me here? In Luke chapter 2, Jesus is born. The Magi follow the eastern star, that great ball of fire. To find Jesus. If any hurting, lukewarm or fallen away disciple asks the question, how can I find Jesus? They simply need to look at the burning ball of fire of God's hot churches and follow the fire. In Acts chapter 2, after the ascension, the apostles gather in the upper room and they hear this violent rushing wind and all of a sudden this ball of fire enters the room and separates on each one of their heads and they begin to speak in different languages if anyone asks the question can a small poor band of ordinary men and women evangelize the world in a generation all we need to do is to look into the scriptures and see the wildfire movement called Christianity and imitate their faith, their hope and love and follow the fire and we too can evangelize the world in this generation. Are you with me here, church? Yeah. Follow the fire. We're going to be studying about Elijah tonight. I have three points. Number one, Sizzling issues of faith. Number two, dying embers of hope. And number three, blazing fire of love. Let's turn to First Kings. In First Kings chapter 17... We find Elijah 
the prophet. Praise to God that there be no rain. And James 5, 17 records, Elijah was a man just like us. I mean, there was nothing in and of himself special. He was just like us, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and there was no rain for three and a half years. Now that's a prayer, amen, guys? No rain. It brought a horrible drought and a very severe famine. But God was in the drought. God was in the famine because he wanted Israel to experience physically what was going on with them spiritually. Amazingly, during this entire drought, Elijah is miraculously fed by ravens. Is that intense? Let's pick it up in 1 Kings chapter 18. There are very few true prophets of the Lord left. As a matter of fact, one of the true prophets left, Obadiah, has hidden a hundred true prophets of God in two caves. And that's about all that's left in all of Israel. But Elijah is still out there on the loose. And God wants Elijah to go talk to King Ahab. And this is now near the end of that three and a half year period. And we read these words in verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to them, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? See, he looked at Elijah as the problem. I mean, after all, it was Elijah that prayed for no rain. He was experienced all the grumbling and complaining inside of his kingdom because of the drought and the severe famine. And he says, You are the troubler. Of Israel, if you went around, we wouldn't have any troubles. Verse 18. I've not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. He says, I'm not the troubler of Israel. You are. You trouble Israel because you do not obey the commands of the word of God. Verse 19. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. You know, you could look at this very humanistically and kind of blow off this event and say, ah, it's just a bunch of church politics. And a lot of disciples have even stopped listening to the preaching of the word of God. But they view things as just a bunch of church politics between a bunch of old guys that just can't get along. Let me tell you something. It's a lot more serious than that. And Elijah confronts the issue. He tells the people, how long will you waver? Get some convictions. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. Verse 22. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bowls for us. Let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I'll prepare the other bowl and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. He says, okay, let's really see who is God. Baal or Jehovah God, whoever answers by fire, that is our God. Verse 25. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bowls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. You know, he was a polite prophet. 
call on the name of your God, but do not let the fire. So I took the bowl, given them, and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar that they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder! Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought. Or busy. Or traveling. Or playing Halo 2. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears was their custom until the blood flowed. Midday passed. They continued their frantic prophesying until the time of the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord which was in ruins. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes, descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. This is very interesting to me. He doesn't use any altar. He wants to use the Lord's altar. He wants to do it right. He wants to get back to the book. Are you with me right here? And notice he chooses 12 stones. Now, at this point in history, Israel is divided. The ten tribes are what they call Israel, and the two other tribes are what they call Judah. And yet I think right here we see the idealism of the prophet. He doesn't set the ten stones of Israel or be random about what he does. He says, God has always intended for his people to be together. He wants all twelve tribes together. Let's build the altar of God with twelve stones. Amen? Verse 32, with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seahs of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bowl into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did a third time. The water ran down the altar and even filled the trench. Is that intense, guys? He says, hold it. Okay, we got the stones, we got the the wood there, we got the bowl. It's all sliced and diced right there. Okay, now, I'll tell you what. We need some water to make this fire really go. (laughs) Would you fellas, would you fellas please pour some water? Oh, thanks, that's good. Can you go back and get some more water? Wonderful job with the watering, guys. Let's do it one more time. Okay, amen. And so the water's just overflowing, not only the sacrifice, but all the trenches that are there. And then we read in verse 36. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are the God in Israel, and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God! The Lord, He is God! Then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them. And Elijah had them brought down the Kishon Valley and slaughtered them there. There was no sentimentality when it came to obeying the word of the Lord. Are you with me here, church? Right here. We see the Lord doesn't mess around. God makes himself obvious. He was obvious in the creation. You look at the heavens. He was obvious there at Sodom and Gomorrah. He was obvious in front of Moses with the burning bush. He was obvious in the chariots of fire. He was obviously in there with Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. He was obvious in the star that brought the Magi to Jesus. And he was obvious in that ball of fire that gave the apostles the ability to speak different language and communicate to all the people from all the nations that came to Jerusalem that day are with me right here. God is obvious. And that is the teaching 
that we learn. And so, we must follow the obvious. We must follow the fire. There are several sizzling issues that we find ourselves with today. We find a group of churches that waver between two opinions. We find a group of churches that have become more and more silent because they are more and more confused about what the heck happened to my church. A spiritual drought, a spiritual famine. I think we can relate to the people in Elijah's time. Amen. The question I get when I travel all over the world, how did we get here? Was it God? If he's sovereign, then everything happens. He either makes happen or he allows happen. Was it Satan? Was it the sins of man? The answer is yes. Yes. I know for myself, the sins of arrogance, the sins of not taking care of the weak, the sins of not glorifying in Jehovah God. Those are wretched sins. And yet, I, I know that it is by the grace of God that he's allowed me to see this day. Because as consumed as he is with righteousness, he is equally consumed with his grace. Are you with me right here? For many disciples, they, they see the end of what they saw as the church they were baptized into with the Crete letter in February 2003. But it would be very wrong to look at all the events surrounding the Crete letter and think that that was the issue. At the Long Beach Unity Meeting in November 2002, quote, all the leaders of God's church, of the movement at that time, gathered in Long Beach. It was there under mainly the influence of the, what we used to call the kingdom teachers and kingdom elders and a few of the world sector leaders that there was the dismantling of the central leadership. All the world sector leaders stepped down and resigned. Now, in the midst of that, this was called unbiblical. There was a shame that was attached. Discipling, one over one discipling in particular, was called sin. There was a cry for grace, which we needed more of. But there was a thought that if we receive and preach more grace, then we don't need any more structure. We don't need Bible talks. We don't need discipleship partners. Grace will be enough to motivate us because everybody's heart is so good if they just appreciate the grace of God. They taught against what they called one-man leadership. And they said the Bible teaches in consensus leadership there should never be one guy. This even broke down inside of the local church where they taught that there should not be a lead evangelist. Sadly, a lot of disciples don't understand what the sizzling issue is. The sizzling issue is something more basic. It is what is our view of the scriptures? What is our view of the Bible? The kingdom teachers, the kingdom elders, and a few of the world sector leaders, almost all of these people have what's called a mainline Church of Christ background. And I think in some ways we need to appreciate the mainline Church of Christ because that is our roots. And there are disciples in the mainline church. But the mainline church of Christ view of scripture is perhaps best capsulated in a phrase that they use. It's, the phrase is this effect. We speak where the Bible speaks and we're silent where the Bible is silent. That means that in order for a mainline church of Christ to do something, they must have an explicit commanding God's word or the pattern in the New Testament in order to make that a valid way to do something in the church. 
say, well, okay, give us an example. Perhaps the most classic example is the fact that mainline churches of Christ practice uh, non-instrumental music, a cappella singing. And the reason they do that is not because they think it's better. But in the New Testament, in the letters themselves, and in the gospel, there is no record of singing with instruments. Yes, there is in the book of Revelation, they would say, but that's when you get to heaven, then they bring on the instruments. (laughs) The sad thing is that this myopic view of the Bible, which really is very narrow because it's only a New Testament view of the Bible, forgets that the Bible of the New Testament church would have been the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, when it says scriptures, it's really talking about the Old Testament. The word for psalm is literally songs with strings, instruments. And so, many mainline churches teach that if you worship with an instrument, you are going to hell. Some mainline churches of Christ have digressed in their communion, and they've said, well, Jesus only used one cup. I mean, he had the uh, 12 guys right there, and he only passed one cup around. And they said, well, we are only allowed to use one cup because that's all that Jesus used. Of course, when the flu epidemic hit some of these churches, they, they changed their theology a little bit. Some mainline churches of Christ say, and this is all true, I'm not trying to make fun of them at all. I'm just trying to make you understand that there's something very basic that's going on here. Some churches of Christ teach that you cannot have a kitchen in your church building. But we have a few problems right here historically. First of all, church buildings didn't even come into existence until 300 A.D. The second problem we have is they do have bathrooms in their church buildings, and there are no bathrooms recorded in the New Testament. Why was the rebellion at the Long Beach Unity Meeting so powerfully? Why did it sweep so much? It's because they embrace speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. The Bible does not record a definitive central leadership. The Bible doesn't have the term world sector leader. The Bible doesn't use the term discipling one over one. The Bible has no definitive structure. The Bible does not emphasize consensus leadership or one man leadership. And the term lead evangelist or youth minister is not to be found in the New Testament. And so with these teachings and with this practice and this view of scripture comes an incredible pendulum swing in difference of teaching. Now, what we've always taught since the beginning in Boston is a very different theology in contrasting to what they call the Christian church theology. You see, the Restoration Movement in the 1800s split in three different directions, but we'll just talk about two tonight. The Mainline Church of Christ and the Christian church. The Mainline Church of Christ has the philosophy of speak where the Bible speaks, be silent where the Bible is silent. The Christian church has basically what I call my philosophy, which is you you speak where the Bible is silent and where the Bible is silent, you don't speak. Or where the Bible is silent, then you speak. In other words, you can do anything you want unless it's prohibited by the Word of God. If it's prohibited, amen, you cannot do it. But other than that, you're good to go. Are you with me right here, guys? So we need to understand that the Bible gives us principles And we as men have been given the charge to have leadership and to build methodologies. And so when we did away with Bible talks, we did away with the Bible principle of small group. Jesus had a small group. When we did away with discipleship partners, we did away with the Bible principle of discipling one another in Christ. Are you with me right here, guys? You see, we need to understand that these ideas of a central leadership of having men over many churches, of discipling one over another, of no structure, consensus leadership, these things super confused the disciples because they were taught, this is the biblical way. And I, I, I say this in all love. In looking at the entire United States, and I think I can say the world, there is not one church 
that immediately following the L.A. or Long Beach Unity meeting and then the Crete letter that baptized more people or planted more churches. Let's just lay it out right here, guys. What is the fruit? On the other hand, the churches that either remain steadfast in the biblical principles of discipling and leadership, these churches began to grow. Of course, one of them is Portland. Amen. Amen. But other churches that really aren't affiliated, like a, a Baltimore or a San Antonio or a Singapore, these churches, too, have grown because of their basic view of the scriptures that you've got to have a methodology to implement the principles of God. Are you with me right here? See, we've, we've got to clear up the confusion. See, we have, this, we, we have a little saying that, that I've heard so many times. Our only enemy is Satan. Right? Well, you better get your Bible open. Paul had false brothers. He talked about false apostles. And he talked about enemies of the cross. Now, if that hurts your theology, get into the Bible. And you better wake up and stop wavering between two opinions. And look at the churches that have embraced the folly of speaking where the Bible speaks versus being silent where the Bible speaks Make a decision and follow the fire. Are you with me right here? The second sizzling issue is unity. Can it be legislated? Can it be legislated? The mainline Church of Christ practices what's called autonomy. In other words, each congregation is independent. Its local leadership has the final say. No outside leadership has any sense of authority on that congregation. The thing that built the movement in the early 80s was the fact that we said, listen, the Bible nowhere teaches about autonomy, but it teaches everywhere about brotherhood. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul is writing here to fix up the Corinthian church. And he says in verse 15, even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, and a lot of people think the church in Corinth grew to 10,000 disciples, you don't have any fathers, for in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I'm sending you Timothy, my son, who I love, who is faithful Lord. He'll remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Paul says, and this, this for a lot of people sounds arrogant. Paul says, listen, you want to fix up the church St. Corinth, then imitate me. Now, later on, he adds in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But I find it a little bit humorous the way he puts things, particularly with our modern day view of things. He says, imitate me and your church will get fixed up. Therefore, I'm sending you Timothy so you can imitate me and fix things up. Now, that's, that's kind of interesting. Notice right here, they didn't call a board meeting. Paul didn't say, hey, Timothy's going to be sending his resume on over to you in the next couple of weeks. And if it's okay, maybe you guys can embrace him and pay him a little bit of money. Guys, this is what's going on. This is not politics. This is sizzling issues that have destroyed our churches. Paul then says, this is what I teach everywhere in every church. That leadership unified those churches. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul sends in Titus and gives him the charge over all the churches in Crete. And he says, listen, straighten things out there. (laughs) Amen? You know, once more, we've got to see what is really going on. One of the most devastated continents in the entire world after the Long Beach Unity Meeting and the Crete Letter was South America. It was totally and utterly annihilated. Annihilated. Countless thousands of people walked away from the church. Countless thousands fell away from God. But there was one 
brother and sister that said, listen, we're not going the direction that we see happening all around South America. And that was Raul and Linda Moreno. Now, like many ministers in many places, they had given into a lot of stuff. They'd really stopped doing the Bible talks and the discipling. And, and Raul goes, man, this is wrong. The baptisms have stopped. People have stopped coming to Christ. I got to do something. And he started following the Portland website. And sure enough, he invited himself on up. He came up here. He and Linda spent a week. They saw what was going on and said, listen, we need some discipling. We need an overseeing evangelist to disciple us and to get our church going again. Now, we'll talk about the replanting issue in a few moments here. But I want it made clear right here. It's been the practice of the Portland church and myself that our first desire is to revive the existing church. When evangelists turn to help for in here in Portland... We are more than willing to help them. When Raul and Linda went back, they began to implement the changes. We went on down, tried to disciple them, tried to disciple the church, and great things have happened. You know, interestingly enough, that church was also planted in 1991. And for many years, they never had a church planting. I said, Raul, I mean, you've got to put faith back in those people. And one of the great things that happened to us here in Portland is, hey, we got the base of disciples rebuilt there by 2004. And we said, hey, we need to have that church planting that was always promised. And we planted by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Eugene Church. Amen. I said, you've got to put back into them dream. And so literally, eight months later, they planted Vineyard Del Mar. Amen. Amen. Then, just recently, they planted a second church, Wacagua, Chile. And come March, they're going to be planting the last of the big cities, Concepcion. You've got to understand, Chile has three major cities, Santiago, Concepcion, and Vinny del Mar. In those three cities are all the major universities. When we evangelize those major universities, we're going to convert young people from all the cities and towns in the rest of Chile. And we will be able to evangelize Chile in this generation. Are you with me here, church? You've got to look at the churches that don't have overseeing evangelists and you got to look at the churches that do have authoritative overseeing evangelists and you got to stop wavering between two opinions and you got to make a decision and follow the fire are you with me here church the third sizzling issue is the dream to evangelize the world in a generation very interestingly, this week, it's been amazing, I had two phone calls on a very interesting subject. The lostness of the world. Turn to Romans chapter 2. I believe there's a great deal of misunderstanding that's come into our fellowship since we've lost our, our, our sense of mission. Right here, Paul deals with an issue that, sadly, some people have begun to wrestle with. Well, are people really lost if they've never heard of Jesus, if they've never had an opportunity to see the Bible. And right here we read in verse 12 of chapter 2, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by the nature of things required by the law, they are a law for themselves even though they do not have the law. Since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their conscience is also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. In that time, God broke down the entire world as Jew and Gentile. The Jews had the law. The Gentiles did not have the law. And Paul says, those that have the law are going to be judged by the law. But even the most righteous Jew didn't keep the law all the time. Even he messed up at least one time in his life. Amen, guys? And so all Jews were lost. Those people that didn't have the law, the Gentiles, the Bible says, no, they're not going to be judged by the law, but God has put on their hearts the law, and so they will be judged by their consciences. But what man has ever lived up to his conscience 
even for an entire day. And so Paul says, all the Gentiles are lost. And so Romans 3 says, there is none that are saved. All are lost. Now the parallel today is those people that have the Bible and those people that do not. Those people that have the Bible are going to be judged by the Word of God. Amen? Those people that never had the Bible or never read the Bible, they're going to not be judged per se by the Bible, but the fact that the Bible's been put on every man's heart, and they're going to be judged by their consciences. Let me tell you something. No religious person has ever totally kept the Bible. Amen, guys? All religious people are lost, and all the people that don't have the Bible, if they're judged by conscience, no man lives with conscience. They are lost. We need to come to a deep conviction, stop wavering between two opinions, and come to a definitive conviction that the world is lost unless we go preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? There is a heaven and there is a hell. And there is no purgatory. Bottom line, you get fired up now or you get fired up later. That's what we're talking about. In Matthew chapter 28, we know from the scriptures, Jesus was the Savior of the world. He came to die for the world. Would Jesus have come without a plan that the entire world could be saved in a generation? He tells his apostles, go to all nations and baptize them as disciples. Now, let's look at Matthew chapter 24. We need to deal this once and for all, church. Does the Bible teach the dream to evangelize the world in a generation? These are the words of Jesus near the end of his ministry in verse 9. He's talking to the apostles. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. Okay, now, when all the apostles die... That's the end of that generation for them. Amen. Thought I'd break that down for you. Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and be put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Hey, you know, if you're going to be hated by someone, someone's got to know you first. They got to know about you. You don't go just, I, I hate that person. I've never heard of them. Never. What's the apostle? What's, what's Jesus? No. All nations had heard of these guys. And they hated them. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Wow. Can we relate to that? Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. All Bible scholars will say to you, this is not the end of time. This is the end of the Jewish temple. They'll all tell you that. Now look what he says in verse 14. He says, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testament of all nations, and then the end will come. All the apostles hadn't died yet. That generation got to see the gospel go to all nations. The dream of evangelizing the world in a generation can and must be done by the command of God. Amen, church? We got to stop wavering between two opinions. We got to get a conviction and say, okay, what do I need to do? Where does my heart need to be? You know, isn't it very interesting back in our first King passage that when Elijah was pouring on the water, he was praying that the hearts of the people would change. He's praying for the hearts. You see, people need a vision. The church needs a vision. When the compelling vision of world evangelism in our generation was taught as unbiblical, was taught as unbiblical, it confused the disciples because that's what they were living for. And then, without a compelling vision, they were no longer compelled to share. The destruction was incredible without the dream. The final sizzling issue that we've got to settle is do we want a fellowship of churches or do we want a movement of God? Turn to Mark chapter 2.
In Mark 2 and verse 21, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will be put away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. He teaches right here, this is Jesus. He says, you don't pour new wine into old wineskins, because the wineskin will bust, and get this, it'll ruin both the wine and the wineskin. Now, those of you all that go back to the campus ministry days, you understand. We built little campus ministries of sold-out disciples. But when we preached the word inside of the church, it ripped that church apart. Because you can't pour new wine into old wineskins. And get this, it not only ruined that church, it ruined the faith of a lot of those young people. All we've got is history repeating itself. Now, again, I just want to make it clear. I praise God for every baptism of a disciple, whether it be in the ICOC or whether it be in the mainline church. Amen, guys? That's, that's the heart we need to have. We cannot afford to be arrogant, even as we study the scripture and apply it. But the application must be made. Many of our churches have become either lukewarm or dead. And where are, as Jesus talked about, he says in Sardis, he says, you know, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. But you have a few people who have not soiled your clothes. In other words, even in a dead church, Jesus says, there are still a few sold out disciples. But what has happened is, is an incredible phenomenon. We have seen in churches that are lukewarm or dead, people leaving, going to denominational churches, stopping, going to church altogether, and no one says anything. But when a small group of disciples says, listen, we got to come out for our spiritual salvation and we want to start another congregation, all heck breaks loose. You know, I praise God for Chris and Sonia of Klopek. Amen. A year ago, they said, listen, they tried to work with the leadership there in the old Phoenix church for a couple of years. They said, listen, we've got to just build a new church of disciples. We're not condemning them. We're not saying they're, they're not disciples in there. But we're all saying we got to get out of there and we got to be able to church where everybody is a sold out disciple. They started with four of them. Amen. And now, 11 months later, there are 17 of them. Amen. Chris has baptized his dad. Sonia has baptized the lady across the street. And just a couple of weeks ago, we sent down the Phoenix mission team. Amen. And now the church down there numbers 30, and they've already had their first baptism. Amen. I mean, God is moving in a great way. You know, I praise God for the group of disciples that was in the Chicagoland area. The group of disciples that came from Syracuse were 17. Portland sent four disciples there. There was the remnant group there outside of Chicago. And they've only been a church of about 30 disciples for a month. And they've already had six people baptized into Christ. Is that exciting or not? Why do we start a new church? Because we believe the old church, though it may be having a few baptisms, though it may be making a little progress, is no longer composed of only sold-out disciples that are multiplying disciples. You see, the plan in the early day of Boston was just to take a handful of disciples and put them into any city. And we believe no matter how large or small that group, they would multiply and they would multiply. In time, the whole city would hear about Jesus Christ. Are you with me right there? Now, one of the misunderstandings that came was, what does it mean to evangelize the city? To evangelize the city does not mean everybody becomes a Christian. That isn't going to happen, amen? It doesn't mean everybody goes to the study series. It just means that everybody hears about Jesus and the true gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, good gracious, Coca-Cola's evangelized the world. Nike's evangelized the world. You too has evangelized the world. Can't God's church evangelize the world? (laughs) 
Some people say, well, I don't want to make a decision about this planting new churches. Now, here in our congregation, we've instructed our, our congregation not to talk about these new plantings as replantings. Because we do believe there are Christians in the other churches. But we do call them plantings. Amen. Amen. And it's very interesting to me. Some of our brothers and sisters went down to L.A. for the uh, campus and teen conference down there. And one of the main speakers who has written against this church and myself called for replantings. Called for people to move to his congregation if they were in a weak situation and need to be strengthened or wanted to train for the ministry. Why is that happening? Now, the Bible says that Paul praised God that Christ was preached no matter what the motive. And I praise God that Christ is being preached in that church. Amen? But on the other hand, church, we got to see that, that, that God's principles become obvious. God's principles become obvious. And what's begun to happen is some of these people are going, wow, that... These churches are not all going to recover. These people are going to have to be pulled in as a remnant, and they're going to have to be strengthened and encouraged, and then we will have to send another group of disciples there. Now, right now, there are some divisions, but hey, in Elijah's time, there was a division between Israel and Judah. But you know, after a while, God got everybody back together. Here's the thing. We in the Portland church did not want to sign a letter and say, hey, we are members of a fellowship. We are already members of the fellowship. We are members of the fellowship of Jesus Christ. Amen. But we want to be a part of a movement. Just like in the book of Acts. That was a wildfire that spread throughout the entire known world in a generation. And if we're going to do that, we're going to have to plant some new churches where other churches have begun to fail. But it's my hope that in time, in different places, the churches that are on fire for God, they may not be talking right now, but daggone it, if we're all preaching the same gospel, if we're all baptizing people of Jesus Christ, I think in time, we're all going to come back together, and there will be a movement of God. Amen? Well, we're done with point one now. It's time to go to point two. Amen. I am going to do my very best to be as short as possible in the next couple of hours, okay? <laughs> there were the sizzling issues of faith, and now we need to talk about the dying embers of hope. Yeah, after the great victory, Elijah prayed for rain, and rain came. But look what happens in verse 1, chapter 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he'd killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. He's all alone. While he himself went a day's journey in the desert, he came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the tree and fell asleep. Have you ever felt that way? I've just had enough. Take my life. All at once, the angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was a cake of baked bread over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey's too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Oreb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. You know, right here, even God says, The journey is too much for you. Now this was the great prophet that took on 450 prophets of Baal and saw God answer with fire. And right here, the journey's too much. I think the thing that struck me as I was studying this passage, and I'd never seen it before, is that after he was supernaturally strengthened by God, he heads off to Oreb, the mountain of God. That's the same place God spoke to Moses. 
You know, there are a lot of places you can go when the journey's too much for you. I mean, there's zillion spots in Israel, zillion spots over there in the Middle East. But why the mountain of God? I think it's very simple. He knew that was a place he could talk with God. That was a place he could talk with God. Let's see what happens. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? So God starts talking to him. He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord's about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went outside and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword, and I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Do you sense any self-pity right there? He went to go talk to God. He went to go talk to God because he wanted to get out of that sense of just life was too much. The journey was too much. That life was overwhelming. That, that he just had enough. And the Bible says that three things happened. There was the wind. I mean, a, I mean, a wind that was knocking rocks around. There was an earthquake. I mean, it just shook the place. And very interestingly to me, there was a fire. And we talked about a fire being the presence of God all the way along right here. But the Bible says that God wasn't in the fire. You see, I think Elijah was looking for some dramatic, traumatic, momentous event that was going to knock him off his feet, knock his socks off, and then he would return to God in power. But that didn't happen. Just a still, small voice spoke to him. Just a still, small voice spoke to him. Look what it said. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel king over Ram. Also anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel. And anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel Malah to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will be put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazel. And Elisha will put to death any of those who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all those whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and all whose mouths have not kissed him. Then Elisha went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. It's very interesting. You know what that still, small voice said to a man to whom the journey was too much, to whom he just had enough and wanted to die? It says, go back. Go back and anoint guys. Well, that's baptizing for us. Go back to what you used to do. Anoint folks. Baptize them. He says, go back and throw your mantle over Elisha. Raise up some young prophets. Go back to what you used to do. And then you will find strength in the Lord your God. You know, I find that in some ways, Elisha's story is not too far from one that I've lived In 2001, when people asked me to go on sabbatical, when people started to tear down the work that's been a lifetime doing, when people criticized the things that I had taught, when people had criticized my family, there, there was an emptiness and a darkness I'd never felt before. Every day I was sad, but at night I was depressed. My friends deserted me. Oh, there were some that tried to help, but they didn't really know how to help. I, I, I found myself having no strength. 
The longer that I was in that state, the more and more self-pitiful I got. And I tried to understand what, what was my sin. What was self-pity, but what was the root of it? I was brokenhearted. I was totally brokenhearted. I was brokenhearted about the destruction of the kingdom. I was brokenhearted about the loss of family and friends. And I, I, I just didn't almost feel like I could go on. There were some, there were some times, if it wasn't for Elena, I don't know if I'd be faithful to the Lord. I was totally spiritually paralyzed. I wish I could say that there was one night that the wind came or there was an earthquake or there was a fire. But you know, daggone it, the Lord didn't do any of that. There was a still small voice called the Holy Spirit speaking through the Word of God. And it took a long time to get to me because... In my self-pity, I hardened my heart. And I lost faith. There were three things that got me out of my darkness. Number one, I had to separate God and the movement. I had, I had put them all together. And so when, when the movement just got trashed, uh, it sent my faith spinning. And when I studied the scriptures out fine, I go, hold it. God is as awesome as I ever thought he was. And as I read my Bible, people are people and people are fickle. Yeah. Secondly, I had to untangle being a Christian from being a leader. And I remember back when I was 17, I made that decision at 1.30 in the morning to say, Jesus is Lord. And then I was baptized. I had the heart to do anything, go anywhere, and give up everything. I never thought about being a minister. And then the most deceptive sin of all. Well, God, don't you appreciate the sacrifices I made? That got it. LA's 10,000 disciples. That didn't happen overnight. Lord, don't you know what I did in Moscow? Don't you know what I did in Manila? And then that still small voice. He says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You see, I thought I deserved better. But what was happening, and I always believe everything that we go through, yeah, God is sovereign. Because he's preparing us for something greater. See, my sin had been that I, I liked people loving me and praising me. Now, I wouldn't have said that publicly, but I, I enjoyed it. Now, it's just total trashing. And I've had to say, okay, well, Lord, what, what was the issue right here? When God took away all of my friends and all of my disciples, he's saying, okay, Kip, here's what I want you to understand. My grace is sufficient for you. That's all you need is your salvation. And when you're happy in your salvation, then you can raise up and be a preacher, a prophet again, and not worry about what people say on the Internet or say in speeches or write letters about. You are to preach the Word of God. You know, the Holy Spirit, by grace, brought us to a church that was just as beaten up as me and Elena. <laughs> and, you know, you got to admit, back then in 2003, people had to be pretty desperate and say, oh, yeah, we're hiring Kip and Elena. <laughs> Sometimes the saddest and hardest memory becomes the best. I still remember my first midweek service. Now, all the Portland people know this story. I 
I went into my first midweek service, and there was my, my dear brother, Guy Hobbs. Now, Guy's an older fella. He's 52. He's six months older than me. And at that time, Guy and I were going to set up the chairs for midweek. And Guy and I still set up the chairs for midweek and devotional and all these things. But I said, Guy, how many chairs should we set up tonight? 20 or 25? And I'll never forget it. He kind of pauses, seemed to meditate. (laughs) Then he looks up. He says, brother, you need to have faith. Let's set up 25. I go, amen, bro. And we set up 25. Now, probably at church that night, there are probably 50 people because of kids' kingdom. But that's not exactly, you know, when you come from a church of 10,000 and then you're setting up the chairs for 25. (laughs) Portland repented. I mean, we all remember the Night of Atonement. It was amazing. We hardly had any visitors coming out, but we started having baptisms every week. And we knew it was God because he was blessing our repentance. Amen. Amen. One of the things that's so exciting now is we don't set up 25 chairs for midweek. We set up more than 25 chairs when we have all of our young people that are going into the ministry. Is that exciting? We, have, we actually have 30 young people, teens, campus, and singles, that say, listen, I have the dream to go into the full-time ministry. Is that fire you on up? And now that little church of 25 chairs, every Sunday morning, we have 500 people at church. Let me tell you something. God is great when we humble ourselves and we remember that his grace is sufficient. Amen? Amen. Last point. 2 Kings chapter 2. The setting for this is 7 to 10 years after Elijah called Elisha. And it's a great text. We'll read it quickly. Verse 1. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. You know, and I think about, and I read that passage. I think about my dear brother, Steve Johnson. There were a lot of guys that I discipled that left me. And some in my darkest hours, I said, hey, you just need to go find your own way. But daggone it, Steve followed me here to Portland. He wasn't going to leave me. He wasn't going to leave me. And you know, Steve's no young chicken. Most people don't realize he's only 10 years older than me. (laughs) No, Steve's a year younger. Amen. (laughs) But you know something? When Steve and Lisa came, I knew it was the hand of God. Because you know something? There was a blazing love that we shared. We shared the dream to evangelize the world. And now he came again to be with me for the battle. Amen? Let's keep reading. Verse 3. The company of the prophets of Bethel came to Elisha and said, Do you know what the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, but don't speak of it. Then Elisha said to him, stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And they replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of prophets of Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, do you know the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, but don't speak of it. Then Elisha said to him, stay here. The Lord has sent me to go to Jordan. Then he replied, as surely as the Lord lives as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Is that hot or not, guys? 
Fifty men of the company of prophets went and stood at a distance, facing a place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they'd crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise not. Now, a lot of people don't understand this thing. Here, I believe that Elijah is trying to, in some way, save Elisha the pain of his leaving. He sensed it was his time to go. And he says, hey, stay here in Bethel. Stay here in Jericho. And every time he says, no, no, I just want to be with you. How different than a lot of guys say, listen, I want to lead my own church. See, that's what autonomy is all about, is having your own little kingdom. Steve Johnson says, listen, I want to be by your side for the battle, bro. I want to be there. Is that our heart? You know, it's exciting for me to see the young guys starting to rise up, the DJs, the Vic Juniors. I mean, I'm excited to see the young prophets come. Are you with me right here? Because you see, everybody, biblically speaking, is either Elijah or Elisha. Who is your Elijah? Right here, Elisha says, listen, let me have a double portion of your spirit. Some people think, well, let me be twice as powerful as you, Elijah. That's not what he's asking at all. You see, under the Jewish law, the double portion was given to the firstborn son. He says, let me be your son. And Elijah says, hey, that's a difficult thing. And so we read this in verse 11. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this and cried out, my father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. He picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it. Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. Elisha got the double portion right there. Can you picture it? The guys are walking along. And all of a sudden, there it is. The chariots and the horses of fire swoops on down. Then Elijah goes on up. And he goes, my father! My father! And floating to the ground comes the mantle, comes the cloak. Now he's in tears. But then he sees the mantle. And he goes, I'm going to get it. <laughs> he grabs it. Sees everybody's watching. And he wants to see if it will work for him. He goes over to the water. Hits the water. It parts. Wow. Now there was another Elijah on the loose. Now there was another troubler of Israel. I want to read this one little passage early on in the ministry of Elisha in verse 23. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some youths came out of the town and jeered him. Go on up, you bald head, they said. Go on up, you bald head. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse from them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled the 42 of the youths. And he went on to Mount Carmel and from there returned to Samaria. You don't mess with the prophet. Amen, guys. Now, we need to understand, this guy had been with Elijah so long, he was bald. His heart, I want to stay with you, Elijah, as long as I can. I want to learn from you. I want to be with you. I not only want to be your best friend, I want to be your son in the faith. That is my heart. we got to be united if we're going to turn Israel around. And just like Elijah... God did not let people mess with Elisha. You know, one of the great things about our church is we've got some bald heads that are preaching the word. (laughs) 
Yeah, I talked about this Sunday at the congregation. I, you know, I've been in camp space for years, and it's always exciting when the young people rise up and say, I want to be a prophet for God. I want to be a prophetess for God. I mean, that just fires me on up. But I never see it until I got to Portland. Because I think not only was everything taken from me, but I think everything was taken from the disciples here. And they realized that all they had was their salvation, that my grace is sufficient. And I remember early on, this bald-headed guy, Jay Hernandez, coming up to me. Now, at that time, he was a mild-mannered middle school teacher. But when he put on the mantle and took off the glasses, he became an evangelist. Amen? You know, Jay began dreaming about the ministry at 38 years old. A lot of people say, hold it. I got to be serious about my life. I don't have time for dreams. Let me tell you something. If you don't have dreams to live for, you have nothing to die for. And I'm telling you, the most desperate people that need dreams are the older disciples. It is time. It is time to get the blazing fire of love going in our discipling relationships and then it's time to start giving each other some kingdom dreams are you with me right here you know it's amazing jay through the holy spirit and angie went on down to salt lake city they went down to a group of 25 disciples that hadn't seen a baptism for two and a half years they are in the capital of the mormon world today they've had baptisms restorations of moving in a year's time they've doubled that church that is preaching the word are you with me right here i'm fired up for that other bald head matt sullivan i mean daggone it here's this guy he's working 60 hours for starbucks and then he says, listen, enough is enough is enough. I'm going to start supporting myself to be in the ministry. And I'll have my wife work half time to help us out a little bit. Amen. <laughs> and he trains full time in the ministry. And now he's preaching the word down in Phoenix. Amen, church. <laughs> and then there's the guy that looks the most like Elisha in the whole world. And that's Nick Bordieri. Now, Nick has learned to comb his hair very carefully. <laughs> Nick, let me tell you something. He's 46 years old. He says, I have a dream to go in the ministry. And someone says, but haven't you worked for Nike 16 years? Don't you make well over a six-figure salary? Don't you have two little girls? What are you thinking about them? What the heck are you doing dreaming a dream like that? But you know something? He just wants to preach the word. And the awesome thing is to see Denise, who didn't want any part of leadership. Because after all, we've got to be practical about our lives. Now... I mean, if there's one that's more fired up, say, Nick, it's time to go. It's time to go, Nick. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> How about it? What is your heart? Are you young? Do you have a kingdom dream? Are you passionate? Are you ready to take on the 450 prophets of Baal? Or are you a bald head? Tack on, it's time to get a kingdom dream. Are you with me right here? You know, there's a, there's a song by Bruce Springsteen called Glory Days. It says, Glory Days, well, they'll pass you by. I hope when I get old, I don't sit around thinking about Glory Days. Yeah, it's just sitting back trying to recapture a little of the glory. Well, time slips by and leaves you with nothing, mister, but boring stories of Glory Days. Let me ask you a very serious question. Are you living out your Glory Days right now? If you're not living out your glory days right now, you need to flat repent. The greatest days are ahead of you. You know some I think when we get to talk to Elijah up in heaven, he's going to tell us, it was awesome being a prophet. I mean, having those ravens bring me food, breakfast in bed every morning was awesome. 
And I mean praying for no rain. That was a cranking prayer. <laughs> One of my best quiet times. Three and a half years later, I said, okay, let there be rain. It was awesome. You should have seen the storm. It was incredible. Yeah, 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 I know. I tanked a little bit after that. Amen. Um, but you know, the 450 prophets of Baal, I'll never forget the ball of fire coming out. I got a little carried away with the water, but it all worked out. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah, it took a lot to get back in the ministry. I just had to go back and anoint. I just had to go back and throw my mantle on a few folk. But you know something? I'll never forget that day walking with Brother Elisha. That chariot of fire. It just took me on up. That was the greatest moment of my life. I don't think God wants his people to go out with a whimper. See, I believe with all of my heart, we've got to deal once and for all with these sizzling issues of faith and make a decision. Let the God who answers by fire, he is God. We've got to revive those dying embers of hope. Anybody can be revived. Oh, you may need to make the radical decision to move to Portland or some other fired up church. But everything is worth your salvation. And finally, when you find a soulmate for life, and I'm talking someone else than your wife. When you find a soulmate for life, when you find your Elisha or when you find your Elisha, there's nothing like it. But you know something? The memory that Elijah is going to like to talk about is the chariot of fire. You see, that's how we all need to go out on top in a whirlwind with the world evangelized. Thank you, and God bless.